skylights. We've been seeing a good number of them come through, mostly through a uh, very repetitive client, a good client of ours. On this particular one, um, and first I'm gonna show like how to properly spec and uh, handle a skylight uh, as far as the supporting structure goes. This project in Indianapolis, Embassy Suites, had a uh, paragraph on the specs that basically told us to not have any thrust on the supporting structure. The wording, it was a little bit vague because it said that uh, to exert no horizontal reactions under vertical gravity type loads, such as dead snow or life, lateral loads when seismic acting upon the skylight would produce horizontal uh, reactions that cannot be controlled by the skylights, but must be resisted by a support structure. So that, when we were going through the analysis on this one uh, with uh, Bernardo, the vertical loads did cause a thrust because this type of skylight wasn't like the rigid moment skylight. It, it, it was able to be, the way I see it is like to be flattened. If you have a, a notebook like that, I yeah. use this for interpretation. Yeah. So when you have a skylight that is uh, fixed here on the top, when you press on this, it only uh, exerts a vertical force on the supports. But when this top is not fixed and is able to, to move, like I'll show you in a second, like to, to rotate, this flattens out and that thrust is what uh, it has to be transferred to the, to the supporting structure. So this is a good set of specs for for a skyline project that actually address the 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 thrust of this uh, of the system. Here is a detail of what we were dealing with on the. This was a remodel too, so they didn't really have. Uh, they were going to open up the roof and then find out what they had, but they showed this detail from the skylight and. You could see that in this area right here, it's not really a moment connection, and this is very similar to the manufacturer's detail too. It is allowed to rotate. Uh, it's it's not a fixed moment connection, and so that is the detail that we had on the on the architecturals, and then on our detail, we they showed an existing curb, and apparently when they went out to the roof and and started the de the de de demolition to install this, they found that yeah we actually have a six six inch three eighths uh, concrete curb. Uh, but per this comment on the specs, we went on and brought this up as an RFI to the engineer on record and say hey we're looking at about eight hundred and two pounds for. Uh, a, a, a horizontal thrust, and I didn't specify. This came from a load combination that included roof live, snow, and wind. Which, if you read this, it's kind of hard to set them apart. Like you, you can't really. You have to combine all these loads into one load case, and you can't say, "Well, let's take the thrust out." It just kind of comes bundled with the load case. So we brought this up in an RFI to the. To the client, the client passed it along the chain to the EOR, and luckily on this one, the response was um, in reference to the load combination would result in a horizontal thrust of 802 pounds, as shown in RFI number one. Blah blah blah. The skylight will be resting on a concrete curb cast integral to a post-tension concrete beam and slab structure. THP does not find issues with the loads as indicated. So we did our due diligence. We brought that up to the team, and they all said, "Yeah." we should be good. Now, I'll show you an example of something that was not as clear and as thorough on, on a similar skylight. This was on an air cargo building. This is the skylight that we're dealing with, about 47 foot long by nine foot wide, 10, 10 foot wide. This is one that Juan Pablo worked on. And when Stuart was getting ready to seal this one, he looked at this tiny little curb detail here that was supporting the skylight. We three and five eighths inch <laughs> metal, tiny little metal, metal stud. And uh, so, yeah, and we were seeing this was in Pittsburgh, I believe. So our snow loads were pretty high, and this is uh, we had a, a reaction out of thrust of almost three thousand pounds for our models. 
So Stuart raised the yellow flag with his experience and said, "We well, let's check this out a little bit further. So we we take, took a closer look at the textural drawings and look how tall this is. It's almost two feet tall, three inches wide. So you can probably put your feet on this thing and you would feel it wobble a little bit, very unstable. <laughs> there wasn't anything on the specs that limited this to be a non-thrust skylight which would be the case where the top top and the bottom are fixed as you can see this velux skylights don't have that that way of uh, resolving moment at the crown or at the sill they just are free to rotate so our course of action was like yeah definitely this it doesn't it doesn't look like it's going to be able to take the 3,000 pounds. It's like hanging a car on the side of this and hoping that this three, three and a half stud will, will take the load. <laughs> so what we ended up doing to keep things moving forward is we put this email together where we were telling them, hey, we added a few of the things to your drawings. But then uh, we had a big note here that said that uh, although the the adequacy of the substrate resisting the skylight is beyond the scope of JI's review. When we see a substrate that has clear indications of being undersized for our reaction loads, it is part of our due diligence obligation of the delegated design process to bring them up to our client. The thrust from the skylight frames is close to 3.7 kips. Uh, looks like the lateral stud framing in that location is about three or four inches deep with a curb of over two feet tall. We have concerns that the curb might not have been designed for the large thrust loads from our skylight. So we show an image there. And uh, also we let them know that although our reaction loads are clearly shown on the sealed shop of drawings, please make sure that your client is aware of this item and, it, uh, and that it gets brought up to the GC or EOR. And highlighted, overlook, overlooking this item can potentially cause structural failure of the curved structure causing water leakage in the roof and even potential collapse of the curb structure. So that, uh, with Stuart, we thought like, I think this is our best attempt of due diligence of making this clear, loud and clear to the client. Uh, so I think we are covered by showing the loads on the, on the sealed set of shop drawings and also bringing this up loud and clear when we're delivering the set of, uh, of calculations and, and shock runs. So just uh, just some examples of thrust loads on our skylights. We've done one project with Gorney some time ago that it wasn't a thrust skylight, I think. No, it ended up being thrust, I think. We try to go the way with a moment. Oh, yeah, we asked him, you can go kind of either route. Because I, yeah. I was like, hey, kind of the same thing. I was like, let's make sure we're looking at those loads. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that was a system that lent itself more for a non-thrust. Yeah, I think there was just a way we found to put in a splice plate. Yeah. And they didn't like it. I can't remember how. Yeah. yeah. But it could be done both ways. But with the skyline we see more often, <laughs> this, this type of system does not lend itself well to be a moment unless you modify something. It's like a pin up there in the model. It just, it'll allow movement. Show the other, you had a section through the ridge where it was more of a uh, potential moment connection there. Yeah. Okay. So, so that one is possibly, maybe more of a moment connection, although it really does lack in the fasteners to be able to transmit, you know, the moment. What I would expect would be something that's similar to that, but have many more fasteners to be able to transfer the moment uh, across the ridge. And the thing with welding too, if they, they come up with a welded solution that really weakens our material up there and it's a place of very high concentration. So are you talking about that welded bar on the other hip section that you were showing? Cause Wasco brought that up in a project years ago that I worked on that that welded bar up at the ridge uh go back up yeah that one, that one, yeah oh this yeah that that spacer yeah. welded bar mm -hmm. <laughs> what well, Wasco is trying to make an argument that that makes it a fixed connection <laughs> at the head oh wow. yeah and that what they've done in the past is just check that bar for 
tension. For bending and tension and compression and everything else. And so long as the bar works, that's a fixed moment connection. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think luckily that hasn't been brought up. And and part of the part of the issue with that, you know, may be in, in proving that out is it, zoom in on that uh, real close. You see that no no not that close. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you see the see the legs that are sticking out there? You know, mm -hmm. if this if this is under a high amount of load, those legs we would really need to look at for bending. Yeah. And I would imagine that they do bend. This could bend so, down. Yeah. Uh, like that. Yeah. What and happened? Nobody understands that alum welding aluminum doesn't make it yeah. stronger. Yeah. It makes it significantly weaker. What happened with this one? Did anything come back? Uh, nope. The ACAA was out with all these notes, and uh, we haven't heard anything back. So we'll, uh, I, it might be one. I actually have a meeting with them uh, sometime today or tomorrow. I might bring this up and say, hey, you know, just. Before you install, just make sure that somebody reads that part of that email, you know. Yeah. Is this an existing building? Or new? The, the ACA cargo looks like it's a new building. Okay. It's a new addition to the to the building. The existing one was the Embassy Suites, the one that had the good specs. Okay. That one was a remodel, and that one was the one that had the good specs. I'm thinking they were coming in with, hey, let's just put a skylight there, but we can't really guarantee that we can take thrust load, so just like make it a vertical load. Yeah. But then when they saw our loads, they were they were okay. Like 800 pounds is not as much. Yeah. So, okay. Zoom in on the on the spec number up on. Up at the down at the bottom. There you go. Yeah, the, they had a spec section for skylights. Oh, that's six. So six, this is unique. Uh, many times we don't get a spec section for skylights. I would like us to start asking yeah. for the spec if they've got a skylight spec. Uh, you know, it 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 alarmed me that there was that section of no thrust in a spec that was for skylights. So I'm I'm worried that we're not seeing the whole picture. So they're just sending us a glazing. Yeah, that they're the just, yeah. you know, yeah. So I, I think that we ought to be asking if there's any special section for the skylights that we should probably review that because they may yeah. specify no thrust. I went through, I did a search on the uh, on our old projects area just for that spec section. And I didn't find very many. And the ones that I did find, they did not have a section in there that, you know, was no thrust. So this may be just an unusual, you know, item good, that they throw into it. Spec, yeah. And regarding specs, there was a, like a keynote speaker on the BAC that talked about specs, about how they're trying to, uh, the guy with the quality control, what's his name? The one that was the host on the second to last but he's trying to come up with a way to put together the EORs, the glazing contractors, and the consultants all on the same page to put together and adhere to specs, like to make specs more available to the whole design team, more easily understood and more basically not just a document that you copy and paste over, <laughs> you know, and then... And, and, for the next 20 years, you use the same template, but actually be a document that is more helpful rather than just a box that you signed off. Uh, so yeah, hopefully we'll see more, more thorough stuff from the Skylights. Yeah, that's all I got. Any questions on Skylights? That number seven is pretty interesting. A one third increase in allowable stress. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Nice catch there, uh, Kyle. Uh, tell me what's wrong with that. <laughs> uh, where's that in the codes? I mean, it that is not. Think, and then I think, is that the same thing? This is uh, one third on uh, bracelet. This, this is a leftover from 25 years ago. Wow. Uh, code before 2000, it had a one third stress increase that was allowed for aluminum design. This is no longer in the code, so nice catch there. So they did copy and paste it. Yes, <laughs> this fact has been around for a while, but uh... but they did. Yeah, I guess you take you can't win the middle. Yeah, there's a good part of it, and there's one that they just copied and pasted. Does it have to do anything with the uh, footnote F, or is it just for aluminum? That footnote that was F, no? that was pretty much uh, aluminum for for wind and seismic. That used to be part of the code. Uh, prior to 2000, 
IBC. I guess this is a good, just try to do a quick side on things that something that's like been on my mind a lot lately, because um, this is a good example where there's like a fine balance between uh, making the clients happy and kind of like finding a way to cover ourselves to kind of like get through something. So like even that spec section is interesting. I get stuff like that on where I built a really good relationship with the client, so I want to help them, right? And that's kind of like on the top of mind. But as engineers, we have a different duty too. And so it gets kind of challenging sometimes to navigate that. Like the skylight thing, that's kind of why I asked uh-huh. you what happened. Because you get this fine balance where you know, and then I don't think, like I said, this one's kind of like in between. It could go either way, but you have to find that route of like where we could have thought about it on another way and said, hey, we can't seal this until we get a full on confirmation that this is done. Mm-hmm. I think it sounds like we're protected. So there's just that sometimes like this is right on that line. Right. So mm-hmm. you just got to be careful with that. Um, because part of me says you could look at it another way and say, well, if that goes up. They're going to say you looked at it type deal that we've talked about. Um, Then I've had stuff in specs where, and I've gotten in arguments with consultants on it with our client, and they just want to get through the top. And remember that uh, the 0.42 thing, the 0.7 that that is technically in the code that you can take, but then it says... That you can uh, reduce the deflection, you know, by (coughs) by, uh, allowing a... I saw it in a spec directed towards... a glass spec so a curtain wall so boot to backtrack just a little not too far but um and we can talk to kyle or we can talk about it later offline but there's a thing in the spec that basically says hey you can uh, help yourself on deflection by x amount and but then down later it says we shouldn't be using this on glass well i saw that in a spec that said hey use this to help yourself on deflection long story short and i it became this weird deal where I was in a struggle with the client to get something to work for deflection, Mm -hmm. but I had that deal in the spec and the consultant brought it up on a call. Um, So anyways, it's just been on my mind a lot. There's a lot of little gray areas of like, can we cover ourselves with a note and help ourselves and like, hey, this is contingent on this RFI being uh, responded to, blah, blah, blah. Or do we just put our foot in the sand and say, hey, we can't seal this until we get somebody to like actually tell us this. We take a look at it, yeah. Unfortunately, and and in this case where we had the thin, you know, uh, three and a three quarter inch, uh, you know, stub for a <laughs> for a curb, and we had about a three thousand pound thrust, you know, it that was that would set alarm bells off for me, you know, as a ceiling engineer, and so I knew that we had to go through some extra steps because. Show the show the uh, the shop drawings where they have that note for the reactions. So, just just leaving the reactions in there, I think that it's more likely that that's going to get passed on. You know, up the chain, nobody looks at it, nobody realizes that there's an issue, and so <laughs> and yeah, yeah, and and so ultimately it came down to me thinking. In order for me to, you know, do my due diligence, I have to take some extra steps here to make sure that my client knows that there's a major issue. That if this gets passed over by somebody, this can lead to a collapse or, you know, breaking of, you know, some of the stuff. So at least we have that coverage in there that uh, do some extra, you know, work yeah. to make that known. And I would say for a recurring clients. It is even more important to do that, like to put this note here and even a follow up call a few weeks down the road once they kind of like out of sight, out of mind for them. But for us, like, hey, on that ACAA building, when are you installing it? Has the GC been able to look at this? Because sometimes there's a good year between when we submit this to clients like Deluxe or API that they're like the vendors to a client. The time between us stamping something and them installing is about a year sometimes. So there's a lot of time between when we seal this and when the thing goes up in in, in the building. Other clients, I feel that they're more rushed and they're like, oh, no, we're installing next week. (laughs) But I've seen that with the vendors that are more the manufacturers and then they sell to their clients, that lead time is a lot longer. 
So that's a good thing in a way because we we have some time to poke again and say, hey, have you asked? You know, where is this? Um, and for them to like be sure that at least they're also doing their due diligence because they, when we deal with uh, lazing contractors or typical clients, they're working a lot closer with the GC because they're on the job site. But these, they're just selling a product for yeah. a glazing contractor to go and install it, and that communication is not off. that interface that they that they have with a with a contractor. Yeah, yeah. yeah and you get um, like with a repeat client, you get pressure too. Yeah. Um, so it's like, hey, I've got to keep these jobs going. <laughs> so it is a tricky. That's why I mentioned it because it all this stuff. I think that's like gold. All that, like you thinking through how do I cover myself. I think that's really important for us all to kind of have in our. <clears throat> It's another trick that I've used is, you know, when I get into something like this, that's like, I'm really uncomfortable, but I'm under a lot of pressure to kind of get something through. But I, and I feel comfortable. I can note it. I've kind of put, so keep this in your mind to kind of talk to your ceiling P on. I put right on the cover of the calcs that, you know, how we do contingent on shop drawings. I say, this is contingent on a response to the smart buy. So it kind of null and voids the seal unless I get that response back. Um, yeah. That's a good little trick. Yeah. The other thing I'd say is everybody needs to be reading the specs. I like exactly what Javier did. Highlight the important stuff in the specs. Don't just stop when you get the information you think you need with deflection and any loads. Read the full spec. Ben had a good one three or four years ago with Rooms to Go uh -huh. where they put in, what, a three – Three quarter inch from the back. Three quarter inch flat max deflection. Oh, I had one like that for a tall curtain. I have wall. one. I have one with yeah. it, with it was a quarter zone and we we have a really tall frame, and they they include that no that 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 maximum deflection is three quarters of an inch. And yours so was, it was an really S it was an SSG corner, wasn't it? Yep. They had to put a two by five bar, I think, or something like that. I don't remember, but I remember that. It was a lot of steel, a lot yeah. of steel. So yeah, tip and and for the reviewers, like when we're reviewing calculations, we uh, like one of the I first first I opened the even before opening the shops, first I opened the calcs, and my my sequence is open the calcs, open the specs, and then open the architectures because that way I want to get any weird project specific requirements. I go through the spec section on section eight and look for any oddities. Like that's the first thing that I do. And I think that's helped me to catch some of these things. And uh, as we're reviewing your calculations for uh, that could also help the engineer working on the calculations. We just jump on the spec, the first thing, take a quick look, ensure that there's nothing odd, and then move on to your more typical structural drawings, architectural drawings, where, where, because that way you know that whatever you calculate your loads, they're not going to be subject to some more strenuous, like performance-based type of engineering, because that's something that's coming up in the industry a lot, the taking the, 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 the code, the building codes, as just the minimum standard for performance. Some owners want to push that a little bit higher because they want to say, hey, there's a big storm come through or even if there's an earthquake in the west coast we want our building not to not collapse so we want it to be habitable or after the event and i've seen that in california especially being pushed into into some of the projects that they're not just designing for the minimum design loads of asc7 but they want a building that's going to be habitable and and, and Utilizable resilient, or resilient after the yeah. after an event. So yeah, big key word that has been coming up over and over. Yeah. Uh, let's let's go ahead and change back. I've yeah. got some other stuff that I can share to 